Hold on. John, if you want to go ahead, I'm recording. You're ready. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Montclair uh, Township Planning Board. Uh, in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by posting a copy uh, of the notice on the first floor of the municipal building and by sending a copy, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to the newspaper designated to the township for notices. Um, electronic notice of the meeting is provided by posting a copy of the meeting notice uh, along with the access instructions uh, on the township website. Uh, and uh, also on the main access door of the municipal building. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live on channel 34 and is streaming live and will be available on demand on YouTube. Uh, this meeting is a quasi judicial proceeding, meaning that the board has powers and procedures resembling a court of law, and we are obligated to objectively determine facts and to draw conclusions uh, from them in order to form the basis of official action. Any questions or comments must be limited to the issues that the board can legally consider in reaching a decision and decorum appropriate for judicial hearing must be maintained at all times. Members of the public uh, are automatically placed on mute until such time as the meeting is open for public comments or questions. Uh, and at that time, uh, they will be unmuted and provided uh, to be able to provide verbal questions and comments as appropriate. Um, and in the event of technical difficulties, uh, such can also be provided via the chat link uh, for the uh, WebEx platform. And if that fails, uh, good old fashioned email uh, to uh, our secretary, Janice Talley, <clears throat> excuse me, at jtalley at montclairnjusa.org. That's J T A L L E Y at MontclairNJUSA.org. Uh, first thing in our agenda this evening is our roll call, and I am here. Vice Chair Brodock? I'm here. Mr. Cook? Here. Mr. Graham? Here. Mr. Ian Wally? Here. Ms. Lockman? Here. Councillor Schlager? Here. Mayor Spiller? Present. Ms. Willis? Here. Uh, Mr. Gilmer is excused. And Mr. Jacobson? I'm here. Okay. okay. All right, we have uh, our minutes from the July 26th meeting. And I received amendments from Ms. Willis and uh, Ms. Lockman. Um, are there any additional changes to the minutes? Okay. Not a move that we approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. Let me ask a question. So um, I'm not exactly sure which minutes we're approving. You had we had two separate emails from Carol and I, and then I think I joined them up as one. So I think we need to be clear on exactly what the minutes are approving. And Carol, I'm not sure if you've had any additional changes after I joined us up. No, I didn't have any changes. I just just was curious if we were able to integrate them. I think we probably could. I think we did, um, but right. Janice, what exactly are we approving? I did not. I did not integrate them myself, but I, uh, Carmel, I can pull up what you what you. Uh, yeah, accepted. my motion was to. My motion was for the minutes as they were amended by both you and Carol. Carmen. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we amended them separately and then I integrated them. And I just want to make sure that we agree that the integration is what. Well, I, I think you have, I have no problem with the integration. I could read it if somebody wanted me to, but I think I had no problem with integrating it. Yeah, I, and, I think yeah. And, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a problem either. And neither did my dog that you hear. <laughs> so I guess we're good. For the okay. record, it's the, the minutes that are shown here. Okay. Right. Yeah. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. 
and then we have our resolution regarding the uh, unified land use circulation plan amendment. Right. And uh, um, Art, I believe that Tony identified a change to the resolution. Um, get that up. Let's see. It was clear to me that Tony was not drinking single malt scotch when he came up with that change, okay? A great catch. All right. I guess I have a question. So I think the resolution incorporates the um, live meeting that we have, right, as part of its uh, language. Um, if, if, if that change is not caught, would the resolution override what was discussed at the actual meeting on the recording? It would probably be something that would be discussed, you know, if we don't make the change right now, it could lead to misinterpretation down the line. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. If, if we approve the resolution without the change being caught, without the error being caught, <laughs> Would, the, would that resolution as um, approved override what was discussed in the meeting? Is it just yes. <clears throat> yes, until the resolution was amended to correctly reflect it. No, I know that, but if it wasn't caught and the resolution was incorrect, would the resolution have overridden what was discussed at the meeting? And, I, and it's a general question, not really specific to this. Resolution controls, doesn't it? Or that's the question. Maybe better stated. <laughs> if there, or, or unless there's a correction to it, that's the whole purpose of passing a resolution. It's supposed to memorialize, and that's what we're that's what so, we're adopting. I believe the change was right here. There's, if you can see on the screen, it's um, not it's not this specific. It's a general question about whether a resolution overrides what the actual discussion was in the board meeting. All right, so this is I have to pull out the copies of Robert's rules. Uh, you know, no, but I, I, I believe there's, I think there's probably a better or faster way to answer it. If Janice puts that into the the uh, unified land use plan with the with the way it was and the resolution said as much, it would reflect that's that's what the quote law end quote would be. If they if it hadn't been caught. Right, so what we're doing, the issue is. So again, I, I think that at the end of the day, the res resolution controls. Thank you. Um, and uh, that if something, uh, if there's an issue between the two, certainly it opens for discussion, but the resolution controls. So this is the change. Lot 27 is in the C4, lot 28 is not. Um, wasn't it always in? The tw I, I thought that maybe it may have been in the zoning ordinance, but not necessarily not, not not in the master plan. So yeah, well, the only thing um, the only it was a little bit difficult to go through because the the master plan that we were presented had no lot numbers. So I had to cross reference again for each each of those um, lots. I had to go on to the zoning map and <laughs> and square them up. Um, and I, well, I don't know, it's probably not worth the time right now, but if I think in the future, if there's a way, if the resolution calls for a lot numbers, what we, re what we review graphically, if what we reviewed graphically had lot numbers on it, it would be far less painful. <laughs> um, right. Rather than having to, you know, figure out where the lots are and, and blocks. Yep. I hear what you're saying. That's a very good idea. Very good suggestion. So is there a motion to approve the resolution as amended? Well, I guess if 27 is already in, there's no harm in leaving it in, right, Janice? Right. Yeah, okay, good. Cool. Thank you. So, so is that your motion to approve, Tony? Yes, yeah, my motion to approve. <laughs> I'll second it. Who was, who was it? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Janice, do you need me to All send right. you a new resolution or do you, uh, can you just make the change? I can make that change. That's a simple one. Great. So now, um, we have the application of Gates Avenue, JV. Okay, Mr. Murphy. Elsie. Mr. Murphy, I just made you a panelist. Please let uh, me know who else you want me to make panelists. Uh, Janice, Arthur, I think I should uh, uh, recuse myself at this time. I have a conflict of interest. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, Chris, Christopher Manos should be a panelist. David Genova. Lou. I, I see David. Okay. Oh, there's there's Christopher. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Lou Lublio. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter Stack. And also uh, Eric Gormley, if he's uh, if he's available. Okay, I've made everybody a panelist that you just suggested. They're all here. Okay. Hey, Mr. Murphy, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board. Um, for the record, again, my name is Chris Murphy with the law firm of Murphy, Schiller & Wilkes here on behalf of applicant Gates Avenue JV LLC. Um, we're here after uh, our first hearing, which uh, this application was carried um, of July 12, 2021 of this year. Um, again, we're here tonight seeking preliminary and final site plan approval in order to permit the renovation of an existing structure for retail use on the ground floor and office uses on the upper floors. Uh, the project includes construction of a 1,953 square foot addition to the third and fourth floors of the building, which constitutes an increase in, in the total building square footage of 11.72%. Um, installation of new windows and doors and landscaping in the rear yard. Uh, the project is located in the C1 zoning district and is permitted use in the zoning district. Um, in connection with the application, the applicant is also seeking variance relief for an insufficient side yard setback, which is a pre-existing non-conformity, um, excessive signage height on the building and excessive number of signs. Um, as this board knows, the applicant presented this project to the Development Review Committee on June 3rd and the Historic Preservation Commission on June 17th. Um, we're in receipt of those re of reports in uh, connection with those hearings. Um, a Historic Preservation Commission memorandum dated June 30th, an engineering memorandum dated May 27th, and a planning memorandum dated July 1st. Um, it's important to note that we did submit updated plans um, on July 28th, 2021, which we'll be referencing this evening. Um, those plans uh, were put together um, to reflect some of the comments and, and some of the concerns of the board um, at the first hearing on July 12th. Um, again, this was part of my initial uh, opening on the July 12th hearing. Um, it's important to note that the project qualifies for a one-time parking exemption pursuant to section 337-010 of the municipal code which states that less than 15% of an existing building and conversions uh, to more intensive uses in the C1 zoning district have a one-time exemption from the off-street parking requirement. Um, notwithstanding this exemption, we will be putting on testimony tonight um, from a professional um, related to parking. Our, our planner will also address this. I do think it is important for the record to state that we are not seeking a parking variance in connection with this project. Um, while our planner will testify to this element, um, we will not be uh, putting on proofs related to positive and negative criteria under the municipal land use law. Um, with that, uh, I would like to introduce our first professional, our, our architect, Christopher Manos. Um, I, uh, I defer to the board attorney and to the, the chairman to get him sworn in if needed. Um, I know he was sworn in under the, under the last hearing, so. 
Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, if I may, Janice, uh, did you mark uh, A14 and A15 in any particular order? No, I did not. I, I, I'm not A15. Sorry? You have A14? Yeah, the last, the last exhibit we marked at the, at the last hearing was A13, the color rendering of right. the place finished building. And, and my notes reveal that currently uh, your second report has dated July 1, is not yet part of the record. And the, uh, and the, the plans, uh, updated plans, uh, I think should be part of the record as well. Actually, my July 1st report is A12. All right, the rendering is A13. The, the, the plans, revised plans dated, um, dated July 26 for the A14. And my update report, which is dated, um, oh, what is it? Looks like it's August 4th. August 4th, that'll be A15. Well, at least it, I think the date on the, on the file name is August 4th, although the date in the header says July 1st. That's what confused me. Oh, of my yeah. report? Yeah, the latest report. But it does, I think, identify itself as the second report in the subject line. Maybe right. that's a yeah, no, it, helpful. Should be, it should be August 4th. I neglected to change the first page. Okay. So. So this my revised reports uh, would be A15. Good. And the revised plans are A14. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Manus, are you with us, sir? I am. Uh, you recognize it, that you testified at the last hearing, correct? That is accurate. And you recognize that you remain under oath for purposes of this hearing, do you not? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Councillor and Chair. Um, Mr. Manos, are we going to be sharing Exhibit um, A14? Yes, we should. Be. Yes, we will today. Okay. I, I'd like. There we go. Okay, Mr. Manos, because this is a continuation of your uh, prior testimony. Um, can we pick up where we left off? That, that would be that would be great. Um, in in regards to the last hearing, um, we we looked at we we took on some of the comments that we were hearing from the board, and if we could, I, I would like to jump right to sheet number eleven of fourteen. It's a three o three. There we go. Right, very good. So um, there was a lot of discussion about the ground floor level at the street view and at the street level and, and how that material was gonna be perceived. Um, we went back and, and looked at our design, spoke with the client, and we felt that if, if we look at, if we could zoom in on um, uh, detail number three, Excellent. Um, what we thought is that we, we took the comments about the multicolored castle top ATAS material that's up on the upper levels. Um, we eliminated that. We felt it was a bit too busy. Um, what we're trying to do here is play off of the black metal frames of the windows and the doors. We are providing a, a dark charcoal black Alucaban metal panel. Um, the, and in the places where the stucco used to exist. And then also in our previous design, we had a multicolored um, diamond pattern that is also eliminated. We feel that this cleans this up. We've also provided for an area for a directory for tenancies up on the upper floors. Um, and, and now we, have a, we feel that this is a much more harmonious design 
uh, to the streetscape so that what we've done at the upper floors can remain at the upper and what's at the ground level relates more to the classical nature of the building, the warehouse style, the look in general. And what we've done here is we provided a few different renderings and views so that this could be perceived a little bit on, on different angles, different perspectives, just so that everybody could be more comfortable with this design. If, if we could also go back one page to A300. If we could just zoom out. The, the other large issue with the um, discussion that we had going on was, you know, what can we do with this wall that we have that is on a property line? It's an existing cinder block wall. We cannot really add any other materials. So my client has worked, has reached out and worked with the, uh, the business improvement district, the BID. Um, we feel that this is a wonderful opportunity to provide a mural and, and the client would like to provide a mural on this as this is a, a, a focal point building as we're entering into Montclair. Um, the image that you see here is not an image. This is not the actual image. This is just an example of what could be on the building, what the size and scope of the mural could possibly be and how the building could be enhanced by this as other murals are being brought into the downtown Montclair district. And then um, finally, on, on sheets um, A201, which is page six, and A250, which is page eight, we've carried these changes through on the exterior elevations. So if we could go to page six, just... Uh, Right, so if, if I go up a little bit, exactly. So the the clouded notes with the, with the revision number two. These are the these are the items that changed. Um, we did remove one of the signs, so I think we were removing a sign variance. Um, we are calling out the black metal panel, the Alucaban panel. We do still have the overhang over the main entrance door for weather protection. It also has down lights. We are showing the directory for the multiple tenancies. Um, and and th that is the extent of the changes from the last round to, to this round. Can I ask a question about this uh, particular slide that we're looking at? Um, okay. The, uh, you don't have these moved elsewhere, those existing fire alarm and uh, Siamese connections. Those are going to remain on the front the door there. They're very yeah. unsafe. That's existing. That that's that's a difficult thing to move. You can't move them to the side there, the side of the. Building. No, that the fire department requires those in the front so they can have direct access in case there's a over a fire. But just around the corner there, foot in. That's not. That's not. Again, that's not our property around the corner. We're we're on the property line, so it it, it typically the fire departments want sign these connections right on the front of the building. It is an existing building and its existing location now. Okay. So your metal panel will be cut around those. That's correct. And you're not doing anything. Are you going to paint those Siamese connections or do anything to make them a little? There, there, those are rules and regulations with the fire department. I, I cannot. Okay. If anything, we might have to paint them a bright red just so they can <laughs> see, or we have to put a light above it so they know that there's a fire department connection and, and they'll see an FDC sign with a little red light above it. Well, the, the, the connections are down like three feet from the sidewalk. That, that's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's for their hoses. I know. Mr. Manos, I, I, I believe we've addressed most of the comments where we lost off last time. I, I um, would, I'm assuming you'd be happy to answer some questions from the board if there are any. I, I would. Well, I have another one. Um, the mural that you're proposing that will wrap around to the front almost. It'll go underneath the uh, overhang thing that belongs to Creek Taverna. Again, we're, we're showing that as an option once we get in with the with the BID. 
and go through the entire process and, and their entire process, the artists, I'm sure they'll have to figure all that out. Um, related to that, uh, I know I had attached a description of the program that the bid, um, the bid, it's a description of the bids program regarding mur murals. Is it your client's uh, intention to follow that program? That is correct. With, with the jury and the, the request for artists and the jury selection? That's correct. Um, and what would the budget be? It's my understanding that there's a, there's a grant process uh, that they have. No, they don't have a grant process. You'd have to pay for it. Janice, I think it may, I think these questions might be more appropriately suited for David Genova, who's the applicant, who's more That's, than happy to answer these. Okay. So while we're talking about the um, <clears throat> renderings and this particular slide, you have you have alternative renderings where you have a window instead of a door for some of the. So uh, yeah, correct. Could you could clarify, good, but, clarify that. There was two options for it. So the original building has an overhead metal garage door. Um, what the client was trying to do is we we wanted to see if we could have two options approved for this infill. Um, if you could please go to um, page nine of fourteen, three hundred one. If you just scroll down a little bit. Which which one do you which uh, one do you right, keep going? Yep, yep, very good. So yeah. it, is it this? perfect, perfect. So so one of the versions would be a glass and a, a black frame with glass in yeah. the garage door style, just to see if we, you know, we were we were talking about in, the, in in COVID if this was some kind of a an open air tenancy. You know, the door could then be opened um, for allowing light and fresh air to come in. And then it would also fit with just sort of the modernization of it, like the, the warehouse style building, yet it's a glass garage door. The other option, if we had a tenant that didn't want to have a garage door, is a glass and steel um, system with a, with, a, with a black mullion pattern to, to match the upper windows above. So this would just be a single swing door. With fixed glass saran. So that single door is that sh is that what's shown on the um, rendering? Yes, um, that's, that's I guess slide. That that is shown on um, slide eight. Eight. A two fifty. Eight of fourteen. Right. So, um, if you go up to that slide, Janice. That's the page up a little bit. If you just pan up. Up. Okay. Or pan down, too, I guess. Too pan, far. Okay. Pan okay. So I see the door, the garage door, and then I see next to the door. Um you have to uh if you would come down a you little bit. Pan down a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. There we go. Correct. Yeah. So next to the door, there's if you go to the um uh, the left, as you're facing the building, there's a window. Correct. Basically, on the existing facade, there is a thin window there. Correct. But on some of your renderings here, you have a door in that Correct. place, in addition to the door that we just got finished talking about. C correct. So, so in the other version where there's a garage door, that garage door cannot be used as a man door. I would still need to provide a man door. Um, so if if the garage door was an allowable look, we would have to turn one of these windows into an actual door opening because one entrance is for the upper floor office tenancies. The other entrance is for the retail tenant on the ground floor. Right. If you go to slide six, Janice. Correct. Yep. You, we see what's on on uh, this slide. Uh, Eight. Um, go to slide six. Slide six, please. 
And you also notice too that the overhang is, is smaller on, on the metal door. Because again, we're not yeah. trying to protect, we don't have to protect the window. Right. So this is the alternative and there are light bars, sconces. Correct. Um, adjacent to the door. And on one side of the, I'll call it the garage door opening, but not on the other side. Correct. So because it, it, then we're on we're on top of that column. The way the way that the existing architecture is. I see. We just we just felt it would have been a little strange to put the light on top of that column. Un understood. Correct. So if you'd like to look at the you know one of the versions here too is if, just real quick if we could go to um, sheet five a one hundred one the plans. Uh, a lower right corner, please. So, so in this version here, whether this was a, 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 a retail tenant or a restaurant tenant, one of the things that we talked about was if we did use the, uh, the, the garage door, we could create a space here that is like an indoor outdoor space. Like it's an indoor, it's, it's part of the interior, but yet it's covered and protected from weather. So it's almost like a built-in outdoor seating area. Is this it? The, correct. This that whole zone. Correct. Right. Would that but be for the employees of the building? Kinds of tenants. My, my, my client doesn't have this rented out to anybody specific. We're trying to provide options um, for the use of the building. Okay. Um, so going go back to uh, slide six, Janice, please. And to the front facade. Again, which is in the upper left. Yeah, there there we go. Yep. So um actually you know what? <laughs> Sorry for this, Janice, but <laughs> I want I would uh ask you to uh let's see where is it go to slide uh slide nine no i'm sorry slide 10 which is showing the existing front of the building i, I yeah that's fine i also have existing photos on another Six. sheet too is this what you want to 10. Yeah, right there. The existing facade. Okay. So the existing facade right now, <clears throat> it almost looks like it's two separate buildings because you have the differentiation in the color, coloring of the brick for two story as a versus four story. Um, the, and you've got openings in the, I'll call it the red brick so slide that seem to be logical for the red brick building and then you have openings for the beige side of the building that seem to be logical for that building so if you go back to the rendering now on that we uh, uh were on on slide six i believe yes okay john i don't know if that uh what we're looking at right there might help the Proposed front rendering. You just want to pan to the right a little bit. I don't know if that will show what you're looking for, but might be helpful uh, to see both of them together. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that to a point. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good enough too. My question is: Is the the brick going to be consistent from the red brick, the former red brick side, to the base side? All of that's going to be the same color brick now. Is that correct? That, that, that's the intention um, until we start peeling off the layers of paint. It, it, it might be a little bit difficult, but the idea is yes, to have the same. We are going to be, we are going to be prepping the building. We are removing the paint um, at our, you, you can see in some of the locations where the brick is visible. It is very close to the same color brick. The brick is obviously from two different periods. So it might mat not match 100%, but the, but, the intention is to have an all brick building once again. 
Okay, well, if you go back, go back to the, if you go back to slide six so that we can see the face on facade, because <clears throat> it's a little, little better for me to talk about it, yeah, uh, this way than at an angle. Um, because when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm looking at this particular version, I kind of see, my mind kind of reads three doors. Two regular sized door and a big garage door. Whether that garage door opens or not, whether it's you know functional, what what purpose it serves, it's not. So you got these three doors along the side, and the door to the extreme left. We now have these dark panels around it, um, and you. It looks like maybe you have a light that's buried up into the canopy. Correct. But you have no wall sconces like you do on the other side. You have nothing kind of dressing that side up. So, I mean, you might want to give some thought to actually purposely making the brick on this building, that little side, a little slightly different color to differentiate okay. it. Otherwise, it kind of, it, it's like you've got sconces around one door, but you don't have sconces around another door. You've got the sconces embedded in the top. We, and then we were, we were. We were trying to highlight more, the sconces for, more for the retail or the restaurant use, as opposed to at nighttime, if it's an office building, it, it's probably not going to be as much traffic going to it. Understood. I think it would, I think it almost think that it might play better in breaking up the mass of the building. Sure. Understood. Yeah, no, it's a good comment. To give that, give that two story a slightly right. different treatment. Sure. Um, and that way you can, you know, definitely differentiate between what's going on there and then what's going on with the other doors um sure. the areas up yeah. above the facade uh where um up above that door that we were talking about with the black panels on the side of it that's basically gonna remain pretty much like it is now very correct you know, just, just a new gonna, color you're just gonna clean it up is that correct. right Okay. That's the existing staircase. Right. No, but can I ask a question of the same line? Those bell, those bl glass blocks, you have them colored in as if they had black grout between them in this rendering. But when you look at the actual blocks now, today, if you're not going to replace them, they're not the same color as shown on this rendering. No, it, it'd be more like the photo on, on page two. It, we're not the intention is not to touch them. So you're not gonna you're not gonna color the grout. You're not gonna color what's in between the blocks when you clean it up. It, it uh, wasn't our intention, but but we we can add that as a a uh, comment. Yeah, I mean, I think part I think of the resolution. Might, I think it might be you know it might help to clean that up. Uh, you'd want sure. to clean that up because you, everything around it's going to be, it's going to be freshened, and uh, you know yeah, you're keeping yeah. you're keeping the glass block, but um, I think uh, Carmel, uh, I don't know whether she was saying that it looks better, but I think it looks better with the black. Oh yeah, but my point is you're giving a false impression of you're saying now you you weren't going to clean these up they're going to be as they are but uh, your rendering has them in black which is it are you going to make them in black as in your rendering or are you going to keep them the way they are that's all i think I'm i think he's saying that they're willing to put them in black they weren't yeah, considering but good. they're willing to put them in black and they're not going to pull out the concrete panels that are below and above the um the glass block windows they're just going to basically clean it up and clean up the brick Correct. On, the, on the outside of the building um, and, the, and those two uh, rectangles that are the rectangle between the windows the rectangle above the windows and the rectangle below the windows they're currently now a beige color is that color going to stay the same uh well the upper one we were what we were, we were proposing to put the the address in six eight gates on the same color maybe in different letters it, it, right it was, exactly yeah and the, the concrete between the two uh, glass block windows what's that going to be that one we were leaving for now okay you're going to see how it looks and the same thing with the bottom one okay oh 
All right. Um, <clears throat> the and just so that there's a lot of a lot of information here on these these renderings, but sure. the um, the material that on this particular on the picture, the proposed front rendering number one that's on screen now, mm -hmm. uh, the gray material that's between the colored blocks and the brick on the upper stories on the two upper stories that you can see mm -hmm. above the parapet what what kind of material is that that's the existing stucco facade that that would be cleaned up and then painted a gray color to match our new metal panels gotcha okay that's that's the existing staircase i was referencing earlier right okay so it's not that our new addition is the curved roof um the metal panels you know we have a little column we have we have, and then you see the square that's coming up through it that's bisecting the curved roof that's the new elevator the passenger elevator and that's going to be brick uh gray brick it's it's like a gray block to match gray the block from downstairs block yeah uh, the first two stories right okay can i suggest that you think about <laughs> painting those uh you know the uh, rectangles on the smaller building a uh, kind of a grayish that might match what you have in the other elements of the building it sure. seems like when you look at the building those beige colors don't really go with anything else and they stand out then are you proposing the same thing for the top of the parapet on that uh, two-story also because you see on this rendering it's it's, a, it's that beige color also you're proposing that also everything it's, gray it seems a little yeah. different color i would yeah you gotta match everything it would be things. harmonious yeah harmonious make them harmonious anyway. okay and then i'm not sure whether you're the right witness to ask about ask questions about the mural mr chair i think i think it would probably be more appropriate for the for the applicant um yep. as they've had conversations with the bid Okay. All right. Then I'll hold off on that. Um, anybody else have any questions uh, from the board? Um, one quick question. If there's a restaurant, yeah, if there's a restaurant with a sign beyond the awning, is that what's planned? That's correct. Thank you. Do you um, propose Mano, any sorry. banner sign? It, 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 I think we, we call that out on. Um, Sheet six, A two hundred one. It's on our front elevations. We call out all the areas for signage. Correct. You, you have it. Um, it's 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 highlighted in red. Existing sign to be replaced with new building signage. Size to be fifty eight square foot max, et cetera. But you don't. You, I don't see any any banner signs or any projecting signs. You have a you have a dotted rectangle on the wall. That that's the area that we would say that the signage would be in, whether or not they want like a pin mounted letters on the on the awning, or they want something set back. Okay, no, that's no. Something that we would have to it come back to for signage. Uh, Christopher, that's that's a wall sign. If the, uh, right. the wall the requirements for a wall sign are different from a wall a requirements for a canopy sign. So what you have on here and you've shown in the area is where you're going to put a wall sign. If you want to put a canopy sign, are, that the maximum letter size is six inches. Right, Secretary. If we, if I may, I, I just what we're being approved for tonight is speculative. We will obviously we're obviously getting approved for um, for the type of sign we've submitted for. If in, I think what our architect is is trying to say is, in the event that a tenant were to want a different type of sign that did not comply with what we were, had approved, they would be required to come back before this board for a different. Approval. Right. I just want to make it make it clear that we're not approving a sign that a, a sign a canopy sign. Correct. The That's right. We don't we don't know. I don't even we don't know what the yep. tenant is. If the right. exactly. But Janice, don't you think we should give them some leeway so they don't have to come back again for just a sign? Well, they have to present a signage plan, right, yeah. Janice? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think it's premature for because we don't know what the sign's going to look like. 
Yeah. So yeah. once they have their tenant and they come in, they, this is kind of the approach. Um, they'll come in with the details and they'll have to come in with, if, if they need a variance at that point, they'll need a variance. If not, then they can get the sign approved. That's right. They only have to come back if they need a variance. That's right. So I was going to ask about um, our board engineer had a few questions and comments, and I don't know, Mr. Manos, if you're the right person to address those or if there will be another witness. We'll, we'll see what the questions are. Hey, yes, yes, he would be the right person to answer these questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Chandler, do you want to walk through your questions? Well, I, I think they're they're basically just related to the report that we issued. Um, I, I haven't heard any testimony uh, on a couple of the items that we pointed out in our report. Um, so I just asked that uh, maybe you could go through those uh, on a point by point basis. Correct. This is the May 27th, 2001 letter. Correct. Uh, Jess, do we want to pull that up for the board uh, or does everyone have that for reference? You can pull it up. Let's see. Yeah, I think it would help. Um, I think, is this it? No, A9. Sorry, wrong report. It's A9, Janice. It's which one is on my on on my screen here? Is this is oh, it? No, no, it was marked A nine. That's what I'm saying. I, I know it may have been marked, but it's that's not what it is. On there we go. Would you like us to go through all the comments, starting with general comments and then the technical review? It's not that it's not that many. Yeah, they're they're not that extensive, so I think you can just you know pretty much touch on each one. Okay. Um. Mr. Manus, Manus, you've had time to review this letter. Uh, yes, we did. I think we, I think we added sheets in response to the letter. Wonderful. So, can you please go through these comments, starting with number one, the general comments? Um, it appears part of the more. We're going to provide existing and proposed landscape areas to confirm. To confirm this statement. Right. So if you I think I think the question is, Peter, there's more than 250 square feet of impervious surface added with this project in the back. So they then have to do stormwater management, right? Correct. Well, we were doing the the um, permeable paper details to allow the water, which we've addressed on the last page, the page Correct. 14 and 14. Correct. So Peter, is that, do the permeable but, uh, papers? Uh, yeah, they, yeah. There was a lot. There was a lot of generic notes associated with the details, so they're going to have to provide some additional calculations, and they still have to do their perk testing. But I mean, the, the standard details are satisfactory, so I I would say this comment satisfied. Understood. Um, we're going to get to parking. So general comment number two, uh, Peter, if you don't mind, we'll hold off on that. No problem. Okay. And if, and if I can ask you just a quick question about the stormwater, what, um, and maybe this goes to Mr. Chandler, what would be the backup plan if the PERC test shows that you can't really infiltrate enough stormwater there? What would, what would the applicant need to do? You, you have to tie into the, to the stormwater system that discharges into the, the municipal system. Okay. And is that yep. something that's feasible, Mr. Manos? Uh, I, I, I would think it would be. Otherwise, we'd have to do some sort of detention, um, you know, seepage pit. Yeah, one, one of their one of their details that they did provide did show an underdrain system. So right. I think, you know, it would they would just have to provide a drainage plan that showed the connection to the to the municipal system. That's all. Right. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. So we're going to skip comment general comment two. We'll address that. Sorry, of, uh, sorry, sorry. I just want to go back to to the first comment, if I might, uh, Peter. If uh, do you think that that ought to be that this discussion about the perk test and the tie-in to the municipal um, system is necessary to be a condition of the approval, if that's what the board decides to do? I think that that's pretty standard policy. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, item three That's is in relation to garbage. Uh, we, we don't have access. To, um, we're, we're a landlocked site. Um, I don't I don't have an exterior refuse area. What we did provide on, on the floor plans is a refuse room um, for the upper tenants. And then also, you know, per the um, off street loading, um, you, you are allowed for to, to put uh, refuse out on the street. Um, and I, I think we touched on that at the last hearing. Yeah, Peter, I, I believe you said that the restaurant, because you don't have the interior design for the restaurant, but there will be space allocated inside there to store the uh, the trash and the recycling in between pickups. That's so correct. you have but interior you, you, storage. We do have storage for the office, though. I just want to make that clear. Right, and then and, and when the, we, don't when the a, we don't know if we're going to have a restaurant. All right, when the retail right when the retail use is designed, you'll then you'll show the the appropriate location Correct. for the interior storage. Correct. Um, As it relates, item number four, um, lighting we, information we, testimony. Right, we we provided a um, a sheet four hundred one. Uh, 400 and 401 sheets um, 11 and, or 12 and 13 of the set uh, a photometrics lighting plan different lighting uh, layouts um, to show all the illumination Peter was this satisfactory uh, yeah that's that's, ad that's adequate yes okay wonderful um item number five the key map has that been Can updated you that on the cover sheet understood okay um Peter was that satisfactory to you yeah yeah it's fine okay um the variances we're going to get into with the with the planner based on this testimony so I think that comment okay. can be um withheld for now um technical comments um ADA accessibility yeah I, I saw you indicated some spot elevation so that one's okay as well okay. correct yep um, um the pervious payment system which we've already touched on uh the fence the fence um, we are doing an aluminum fence not not a, a vinyl fence we do have some it's like a standard we have planting details landscape installation um we do we do show these details throughout in the set on the updated set of, of july 28th um, correct those were okay we have the ada ramp for the, the the rear of the property so we can egress out of the uh backyard the back patio and, and then, then we have the planting schedule we, we on the last on um a402 mr chandler was that satisfactory for the purposes of this yeah I think, yeah the only thing that i think uh might potentially come into play there would be the trash enclosure but that would be at a future date if necessary but understood, understood. yeah okay uh, Mr. Thank Chair, you. I'll turn it to you. I was going to ask just one final question. Mr. Manos, would you consider using native plantings in your uh, landscape design? We consider them hardy for an urban environment. I, I don't know if they're necessarily native. Would you consider using native plants is, is my question. Oh, um, we, we, we yes. We chose these plants because they're, you know, they stay green. They're they're green. They're hardy. They they they're they're, you know, they they stay nice and full all season long. They're not something that drops a lot of leaves. So it's it's a type of a, a planting that would would look full even in the winter. Are there equivalent but, but native plants that would have the same functionality? The same functionality. Um, same characteristics I, I would I would I would think so I mean I would say this is uh you know counsel for for the applicant and Mr. Manos correct me if I'm wrong but I, I think the applicant would certainly be willing to explore this option sure um, if there is a plant that is if there's a native plant that has the same characteristics I I am sure my client would you have no problem that. Yep. um sounds good that's all I have any other questions from the members of the board? Does not appear to be. Janice, uh, we'll open it up and ask if there are members of the public 
in attendance that might want to ask questions of this witness uh, in connection with what he testified to this evening. Okay, uh, members of the public, I have unmuted you. So this is your opportunity to ask any questions of Mr. Manos. You'll have to turn on your microphone. And if you can't, if it's not working, you can uh, post the message in the, in the, the chat box for me. I don't believe we have any comments. Okay, well, let's keep moving and, and if something turns up, uh, you know, we can backtrack. All right. Sounds good. Uh, so, Mr. Murphy, your next witness. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we have uh, David Genova, who's the applicant. I think it'd be helpful for him to address some of the comments uh, specifically related to the mural, um, if, if, if you would like. Okay. Um, Councillor, I, I, I believe Mr. Uh, Genova was sworn in um, as part of the last hearing. Let's, let's find out from him. Mr. Genova, can you hear me? I can. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, you're, Mr. Murphy thinks you were sworn in at the last hearing. Would you agree with him? I do agree I, with him. And therefore, uh, I would uh, just ask that you be cognizant of the fact that you remain under oath for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Mr. Genova and Janice, if we could pull up the, um, the site plan uh, A-14 um and go to page i believe it's eight did you say which page uh i'm getting there now i'm just uh i apologize it's um page 10 of 14. there we go oops great yeah just we can go down a little bit um, Mr. Genova, if you could just explain your conversations with, with the um, Business Improvement District and the process involved in um, the selection of the artist um, for this, this mural. Again, this is a, um, an example of, of what could be there. This is not the actual painting that will be on the building. Um, if you could do that for the board, uh, Mr. Genova, that'd be very helpful. Sure, sure. Um, to start off, the the mural was designed uh, for this um, this uh, visual to show kind of what it could do, not necessarily what it will do. Um, the idea was to show that it could wrap the building, that it could be the length of the building, it could be somewhat geometric, and also could be um, could be as long as the the masonry side of the building. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to. And if the board wanted to put limitations on which elevations could be muralized, uh, we'd certainly be okay with that. Um, I've gone through the jury process with the Business Improvement District before for a mural that was on uh, one of my buildings on Glenridge Avenue at 131 Glenridge Ave. Um, to Janice's point on the budget, if I remember correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the artists kind of come out and look at the space and give ideas and budgets somewhat simultaneously, and then we agreed on a budget. Um, and uh, and then, you know, there was this juried process by which the artists were selected uh, and kind of vetted by the Business Improvement District, and it was executed based on the agreement of all parties uh, based on that for content and budget. Um, okay. yeah, that, David. Was, that was what I remember the process to be on, on, on 131 Glenridge Ave. And that's somewhat similar to what my conversation was with Jason Gleason right. regarding. Right. So I spoke with Jason because the, the bid received a grant for their, for their mural program, but that, that grants expired. They've expended all the money. Um, so since you offered to do a mural, I thought it would be really good to use their process. Correct. But since they don't have the grant, I think that we would have to establish a budget that you would have to pay for this. You'd so want to establish that as part of this proceeding. I mean, I, without knowing what the artists would charge, we didn't 
come up with a budget for that. That was kind of given to us by the artists in the last well, go around. I in, my, in my discussion with uh, Mr. Gleason, it, the, the budget was based on the size of the building facade. And so, you know, I explained this to him and he said, this is comparable to the facade uh, facing the Crescent deck on the back of that one building. It's about, okay. we, we looked at the dimensions and the budget for that mural was $20,000 was the the one on the side of the crescent deck no the one on the back of the building that faces the 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 drive going to the crescent deck okay it's not on the crescent deck it's um it's near I, I i i think i know what you're talking about yeah it's a pretty it's it's <clears throat> in size to this building to this facade so i just wanted okay. to understand you know as part of this discussion, you know, the size of the mural, the cost of the mural, so that you know, we all know what's being discussed. Well, it sounds I mean, like Janice, it sounds this is a council for applicant. It sounds like we have based on that conversation, have some understanding of what something like this could cost. Um, you know, it was our intention that um, this would be the responsibility of the applicant. Um, Mr. Genova, correct me if, if, if I'm Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, th I think we're, I mean, it's kind of hard to agree to a budget from someone just saying it in a board meeting compared to dealing with an artist. But if that was a similar budget, that was our, you know, that fits in with our understanding. Well, wouldn't, and we wouldn't, Janice, excuse me, but we wouldn't necessarily put a number in the resolution, but it would be our responsibility to, to procure this and, and to make this happen. Is, is that how you would like to do this? I, I guess the question is to the satisfaction of the bid. Correct. That was that was what I had spoken to, yeah. to Jason. About. And that's the I think I think I, I just want to make sure that you get I mean, I know you want a quality mural. I think we all want a, a quality mural. And if we we, we you know, I, my understanding in the discussion with the bid, that's about the, what the budget would be. But we, if you say it's to the satisfaction of the bid and that you're not going to rely on a grant that they may or may not have, this would be something that you know Correct. you would pay for and they Correct. would they would you would use their process Correct. that's something that i would offer the board to consider as part yeah, of and that. that that was our intent kind of treating the bid almost like a subcommittee here uh and going through their process that has worked on other buildings in the downtown corridor to try to procure a mural that's satisfactory to all right and this isn't the as for the approvals and the resolution this isn't a mural on the side of the building necessarily at our choosing. It's to go through the, be, the you know the bid process in selecting an artist to paint a mural on this on this facade. Right. And I just want to make it clear that if that's that and that it would be at your expense. Correct. So, Mr. Genova, I don't know if you have anything else to add. I obviously can answer. We can answer questions from the board. I'm sure there are plenty. Um, no, no. I mean, that was that was the purpose of going through the bid was to kind of create the jury, uh, the jury scenario, and give the board comfort that there would be someone overlooking this process. But I'm also happy to answer any questions. So, my first question uh, about this is. If I'm understanding what was presented, uh, it, there's sort of a representation, I won't call it a guarantee, but it's a representation that this will be maintained for five years. And then what happens after that? The mural itself, you're saying? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know about a five year uh, maintenance, but we would agree to that and whatever the bids process is. This is not something we don't want on the side of the building. so. Uh, well, I don't know any reason we would take it off, but yeah, no, and, I mean, we would agree so, to their terms and conditions. Right. And I, I, I guess I'm just looking for an understanding that, you know, that going forward that the mural or some kind of mural on the building will be maintained, um, you know, on the building while it remains in this use in this state. Sure. Sure. We'd agree to a maintenance obligation. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, just don't want I've, to I've gotten to see three or four of the rooster renovations in my life in Montclair on Park Street. And we would agree to the same same concept. Right. Okay. Fair enough. 
Um, I, I have a question in that regard. If, uh, if the building is sold, will the obligation continue to run with the new owner? Are you asking me that, Mr. Neese? I am. Um, I, I, how to mechanize that in a sales contract? Maybe better question for council, but if it were part of the land use obligation to the site, I would imagine that they would be required to the same way we would under resolution. Okay. And, uh, I, yeah. and, and in terms of the chair's question, um, uh, the as I understand it, the bid process, uh, the, the memo that Janice uh, sent to all of us, um, did have a five-year plan. And uh, I had the same question the chair did about what happens after five years. Just, just so you know, that, that's an issue that the bid has as well. You know? <laughs> that's one of the things they want to fix, uh, fix in their uh, mural program moving forward. Yeah, yeah. so we, we would be looking for a commitment for maintenance you know, that wouldn't be limited to the five years. And I think the, the applicant is saying that that's not an issue. Not an issue. Right. Anything else? Arthur? Not for me. Thank you. Anyone else questions? I have another question and I, I may have, um, this may go back to the prior witness, but Janice, on the slide that's showing on the screen, would you would you um, zoom to the, yes? So we notice on the back of the existing building, there's that beautiful steel sculpture that <laughs> is is um, adorning the back. I'm assuming that that has to remain in place. Is that correct? It does. It does not. One does of the not. struggles in this building is that there are not two means of egress right now. Um, and if we had to pinpoint the reason for this addition in its entirety is to create an internal closed staircase at the rear, which is referenced by the new masonry uh, kind of where Janice's cursor is now. Um, so that 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 uh, fire escape gets to come off. And that is essentially the reason for the addition to accomplish that. All right, excellent. I just I, um, wanted to see um, if that was since it wasn't showing in the in in the proposed side rendering. I wanted to just make sure that uh, yep, it was that is being removed. Okay. okay. I don't think I jumped in quick enough just to finish up about the mural. Um, I think what you're showing is very busy. And when I thought about a mural during our last discussion, I was just thinking about that tower thing. You know, the enclosed staircase thing being just just the staircase. Yeah, just so it's so it's not as, you know, overwhelmingly busy. You already have, the, I guess, a design element with the, uh, you know, the sh the uh, fish skin or whatever you want to call it. Of the have you, uh, yeah, so I would just leave just the column going or the whatever the brick thing going up with some kind of mural on it and leave it at that. And it's a much less space, I think, so it does go higher. Parmel, have you looked at the uh, mural that's over by the Crescent Deck? That's not my favorite. My favorite murals are the one on Walnut Street on Fink Street, the uh, older woman and old man. Uh huh. And those are very nice. Something like that. Something yeah. different. You know, something. You know, those are in tones of gray too, which would kind of match this building. But I don't know if that was privately done or if that went through bid. But those are very nice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just a thought, just to go up the column there rather than throughout the whole bottom of the building. Well, I guess I guess at the end of the day that the competition um, could be open to a, a number of different ways to put a mural on the side of the building to complement the architecture and also to add to the streetscape. So, um, you know, keep your keep your solicitation for ideas open. Um, because the other point when or during our last discussion was you don't necessarily, maybe you don't want to put a painted mural, some kind of metal or, you know, sculptural kind of element might look nice there too. You know, just as Chair Wynn says, keep your options open. Yeah, that's, that's you know, so the, the reason I liked the, you know, what's kind of presented here was it, it really breaks up a lot of that gray mass 
that we saw in the past rendering. And that's really what I, you know, personally had an issue with was just the yeah. wall of gray. And so I, I, I like that there's, you know, that this is a fairly large horizontal mural. Um, and, and, you know, would like to see something similar to that, although, you know, I'd keep the options flexible, but I would support something larger here. I personally, I happen to like the irises that are on the, by the Crescent deck and they, and they take up a lot of the wall, but that it doesn't cover every inch. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of negative space in there also, which I think, you know, helps, helps break it up and helps keep it from being too overwhelming. So I, but I, I will concede that there's a number of different ways that this, you could get something very attractive here. Um, and so you are, like I said, you're, if you keep your solicitations open, you may come up with something that we haven't even thought about. So happy to, happy to keep our minds open. When, when we started the process on 131 Glenridge Ave, it was, it ended up being an entirely different facade that the artist wanted to approach by the time it was done. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it turned out, I think it turned out great, but, uh, but, you know, kept our options open and just yeah. kind of flowed with the artist. Yeah. I guess the only thing that I would ask is that you, um, whatever you decide on that you, um, keep the, that the planning boards, uh, review committee, um, to make sure that it, it's enough to satisfy the intent, uh, of the planning board, you know, one way or the other. But, um, you know, I don't think that, uh. I don't think that we have to pin it down to the parameters of the projection. Um, if something else can come come there that will uh, enhance the uh, the downtown area. So, David, just since we're talking about murals, this is a little off topic, but since you're here and we're talking about murals, sure. do you own the building, the Saxon building that has the old map of um, Montclair on the side of it? On Glenridge Avenue. That is not a Saxon building. Is that your building? It is not. No, the 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 Saxon building that I'm working on is the Madison building next door to that. The building that has the old map is the um is the uh, Scott. Uh, what's his name? He just came in front of this board for an expansion of of Studio 042. Okay. Does somebody needs to restore that map? Anyway, that is that is not, not my map. <laughs> not your map. Okay, but that's an example of you know something that was probably approved and now it's you know being neglected and it's deteriorating, and we wouldn't want your mural to have the same fate. I agree. Uh, if I could just get a clarification from the board, um, Carmel, you were discussing the mural, the size of the mural. Is there any intention on the part of the board to limit its size just to the rear facade, or does the wraparound? Is there any? Uh, is there any? Uh, can I get guidance? Is, is really what I'm asking as to whether or not uh, the board wants to limit it or just allow the imagination of the artist to take hold. I would. The imagination of the artist. I agree. I agree. Let the artist come up with with some ideas. The only uh, I would want the planning board's review committee involved just to make sure that it was in general along the lines of what our intent was to keep this from looking like a prison. <laughs> Basically, I think that was the comparison that was used last time. <laughs> Correction facility. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions with the board? Uh, if not, uh, I once again, we'll open it up to the public. If there are questions from the public of this witness concerning his testimony this evening. Uh, public members of the public have unmuted you. So if anybody has a comment, this is the time to make your comments or questions. I should say questions. Okay, it does not appear that we have any questions. All right, Mr. Murphy, next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
And Lou Lugio is our parking traffic engineer. Um, we can get him sworn in. He was not uh, sworn in at the last hearing. Mr. Lugio. Yes. Yes. You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, do you Hopefully, you can hear me. I can hear you. And okay, how, are, how are you, Lou? Good. Very good. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you please state your full name and business affiliation for the record? Sure. It's Louis Lugio. It's L U G L I L. And I'm with Sam Schwartz Engineering, located at 30 Montgomery Street in Jersey City. Okay. Uh, can I qualify my uh, expert? Please do. Okay. Wonderful, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Lugio, um, for the benefit of the board, can you please provide information on your uh, professional experience and educational background um, in order for us to qualify you as an expert um, in traffic engineering? Sure. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology, a Master's in Transportation Planning, also from NJIT. I, I am a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and a few other states. I've been practicing uh, transportation planning, traffic engineering, which includes parking, uh, for the past 33 years. Uh, I have served as an expert witness for New York, I'm sorry, New Jersey Department of Transportation, many uh, municipalities within New Jersey, and also served as an expert witness for private applications. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Thank Chair, you. do we accept this witness as a expert in the field of um, traffic engineering? Yes, we'll accept yeah. it. Okay, wonderful. Um, this is an interesting witness because we're, we're, we're not seeking a variance related to parking, as I mentioned in my earlier comment, um, our opening, uh, that being said, we, we take this issue seriously. Um, we wanted to explore it quite frankly. Um, it's incredibly important for us to understand, um, what the available parking situation is as we market this building, as the applicant markets this building to potential tenants. Um, you know, certain office tenants are going to need on site parking. If they don't have it, they simply, you know, wouldn't be a tenant. So it's important for us and our applicant um, to understand the parking situation in the municipality and as it relates to this building specifically. Um, so we did bring in Mr. Lugio and his team up to to look at the situation and Mr. Lugio is going to explain our findings and, and where we are on this issue. We'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Um, our, our professional planner, Peter Stack, um, will present next. We'll also touch on the issue. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Murphy, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Somebody, somebody's not on mute and needs to be because we're having, you're, you're cutting in and out to somebody who should, who should be unmuted. Yeah, I, I don't know who's, it seems to me everybody's muted. Trying to find out who's not. All right. Like, I think that's better. Like, yeah, it seems like that's better. So uh, ho hopefully it's not me because then that would be a problem. But I do have a dog that might be sleeping next to me that's pretty loud. But we'll see. If it's me, I'll move him. I, I think you're okay. And uh, <laughs> it looks very nice and sunny wherever you are, whatever city that is. Um, yeah, that's just the background. <laughs> but if I. I, I Chair, Mr. Chair, do I, and, and Janice, do I have to repeat myself? Do, we got the general sense of what I was saying. We're okay. Okay, I see a thumbs up. So, um, Mr. Lugio, can you please, uh, please provide some testimony on this issue of parking? Um, the understanding being that we, the site is limited. We're, we're not able to provide parking on the site. Um, there is the one-time exemption um, under the municipal ordinance section 347-010, um, which exempts this specific project and property from a parking requirement. Um, can you please provide testimony? Sure. And and with all of that said, what, what we did was we looked at basically a quarter mile radius um, around the site 
basically up and down Bloomfield, but also, you know, in, in some of the other locations where uh, public parking was available, whether it be uh, in a parking structure in a surface lot and and including the on street um, parking that is available. And so what we did is we looked at it um, basically from four different time periods during the day. Uh, we did site observations to really gauge what the parking utilization was at those four time periods during the day. And so we looked at 6 a.m., um, 11 a.m., 6 p.m., and 8 p.m. And so that gives us an idea of what's happening, you know, before basically the, the office uh, starts to get going, uh, what happens when basically everything is kind of set pre lunchtime at 11 uh, 6 p.m kind of the post uh, office uh, time period and then 8 p.m which really captures what's happening um, with respect to whatever other land uses are open and operational um, we we looked at uh, you know the the bay uh, deck uh, we looked at a couple of other decks that were uh, more commuter driven and we kind of separated them out. Uh, we looked at basically a, a number of different parking and surface lots and structures and on street. A combination of all of those without some of you know, the bigger lots that, that we basically excluded, we had about 500 non-permit uh, metered spaces uh, in some fashion that were available from from a capacity standpoint that those 500 spaces not including you know the crescent deck that that has about 429 and uh some of the other you know larger decks that, that are really associated um you know with a, ter a certain activity so did you, we did kind you of say, did you, say that you included the did you say you included the bay street deck in your analysis no we did not and we wanted to keep that. We wanted to keep that out, um, and we and we definitely wanted to keep it within a quarter mile, and it's probably right in the cusp or a little bit over. So we we kind of kept it tight, and we kept it to about that 500 non-permit capacity, again both surface structure uh, or on street, and then we looked at it again in those four different time periods. Um, what we found that for the most part, uh, we have definitely available parking uh, in a combination of different areas uh, from, you know, the 6 a.m. period was probably, I want to say, the most parked, but then during the day, we also peaked a little bit. When we averaged everything out, uh, we were looking at, of the roughly 500 parking spaces, about four, actually 456, uh, about 350 of those parking spaces um, were, uh, were not occupied at a certain period of time on average. Uh, we basically had at least 250 parking spaces in that quarter mile radi radius uh, that had some availability depending on the time of day. Uh, when we focus in on looking at, you know, office land use uh, that is proposed here, and people that are coming uh, here for that purpose, there's definitely parking that is available within that quarter mile radius. And and really, it, it we, we also took out all of the permit spaces. So it was really a, a, a metered uh, parking space. If we added in permitted spaces that were also uh, available, uh, then the numbers would probably go up. So for this level of office that, that we're talking about, especially in, in this area, it's basically not a, a suburban area. It is a built up area, built up environment. Uh, it, it certainly has proximity to the train station. Um, from my opinion and looking at what the square footage uh, that we have, what the additional square footage is going to be, and the availability of public um, and other parking, whether it be in the service facility structure 
uh, or on street uh, during different times of the day, there's certainly available parking spaces uh, within that quarter mile radius. So I'm going to start with some questions. If if you're finished, yes, I am. Um, with regard with regard to the tenants, obviously the building's not built. You don't know who the tenants are going to be. Did you make any assumptions with regard to uh, how many tenants of the building are going to need parking substantially all day? Well, we we made some assumptions of you know who the tenants could be and what their travel pattern might be uh, to get to work and, and what their parking um, would be. And they would actually have to know, and that would be part of their lease, that their parking is basically not provided on site. Uh, they, there is available parking and obviously not only, you know, your website, but also the, the management company the manager would also explain to the tenant and we part of their lease that there's available parking in, in other locations in different locations and that would be part uh, of that agreement. No, I understand that no. you're you're not proposing to provide on site parking You're proposing to have these tenants take the very limited spots around the building uh, that right now are being used by members of our community and, and patrons of our of our various stores on Bloomfield Avenue and otherwise. I was just asking whether you have an idea of the number of cars that you anticipate needing to take, you know, basically arrive at 8 or 9 a.m. Right. and stay there till the end of the day. And, you know, you don't know. I, I would say that based on, on this square footage and the type of use here, it would probably be about 40 parking spaces that would be required. And because we don't know what kinds of tenants you're going to have, we don't know what the average time of a visitor's visit to the building would be during business hours. We, it could be a half an hour, it could be an hour, it could be more. We just don't know who's going to be there. Is that about right? That's true. Look, I, I appreciate your testimony, and we know from prior hearings on this application that there is a one-time exemption. There's nothing we can do about it. I will say for the record, um, I am very much opposed to what you're proposing to do here. It, it is what it is, and we can't do anything about the fact that you're proposing to build this building and not have on-site parking. But for for you to come in and give that testimony and say that at some point in time there were spots available in the quarter mile around it, I don't doubt it. I mean, if you look at any spot during the day on Bloomfield Avenue or in, in its vicinity, there will be available spaces. But you are proposing to drop this building here in the middle of a very busy time and suck up a very substantial portion of – what you're saying are are periodically available spots in the area um, where people are going to plant themselves during the entirety of business hours to the detriment of, of our local businesses that need those spots for transient uh, people to come in and patronize their stores. And so, you know, I, I, I've said it before at these meetings. I'm going to say it again. It is what it is. It's a beautiful building. It's an improvement over what's there. But to be depositing that in that space without providing on-street parking is going to hurt businesses in that area. It's going to hurt residents in that area. It, it's it's really it, it's exactly the kind of thing that I signed up to stop when I joined this board. I can't stop this one. Um, but it's this, this testimony. I, in some ways, I wish you hadn't offered it because it, it would have been better, in my view, if we just had to suck it up. But to hear that testimony, it, it, it just makes it worse. It, it's it's you, you you basically confirmed what we already knew, which is that this is a very busy area, and you're now talking about having another 40, 50 cars that are going to need to take up spots in front of somebody's house or spots that would be used by somebody who's going to come patronize a, a local business and stay for half an hour and then give up the spot to somebody else. So it is what it is. I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate everything that you're trying to do here to improve this part of the neighborhood, but it's not what I would do if I could change this. If I could change the law and take away the exemption, I would do it because I think it's a bad idea for the town. I I have some questions as well. If I could, if 
I um, Mr. Lugio, when you did your um, your uh, time period when you checked on the time periods and did your survey, did you do that three weeks ago? Did you do that six months ago? Th that was done. Uh, it was a Tuesday, Tuesday, June twenty second. Mm -hmm. So uh, this past, this past and it was year. a snapshot. Yeah, this, this past, past year. year. Okay, yep. I I hope that you um I hope that everybody understands um things are a lot less there are a lot less cars in town I believe parking and and in our decks because of COVID people are still not commuting so our decks have a lot more space in them at this time I also want you know, there's um an elementary school around the corner from from this building. And when you did your survey between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m., school starts at the Bullock School, I believe, at 8.35. And buses, there's many, many buses that come in and around that area. There's also the parking lot does not um, does not hold every teacher and uh, staff of that school, and they park in the street in and around that area. So mm -hmm. I think when you were there, school was already let out. And, and it was a reduced amount of students and staff that were in the building at the time because of COVID. So I don't think this snapshot is is accurate of what, what would be there, hopefully in September, you know, the next going on after September when school is in, in, full, in full bloom. I also, um, when you mentioned that the tenants, the tenants and their parking, would they be directed to park in the decks? Or is it, or are they, or they have to? Otherwise, these workers uh, will be coming to work, riding around looking for parking spots all morning. And, uh, I, I think, I think, I think a few things. Um, one is that when when we do the observations, we do them at basically different periods of the day to really get a snapshot of um, how much of the parking is being utilized or not utilized, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so yes, in, in definitely this COVID time, we certainly have less commuters, uh, and that's why we excluded some of the mainly commuter lots associated with uh, the utilization study. Uh, but we also have people that are, are basically home utilizing a parking space in, in some of these facilities as well. Um, when, when certainly there are, there are many buildings, uh, that are like this, that really don't have a uh, parking associated with the site itself or parking on site. And so when we talk to a pr prospective tenants of this space, it would be known that the parking is not provided and there's, you know, there's a, there's parking, uh, within a quarter mile. Uh, there's also obviously transportation, public transportation that people would get to. So there's there's certainly going to be a market for this type of of office product, and that's really what this is geared towards. Thank you, Mr. Lugio. Uh, Mr. Chair, if there's any other questions from the board. Board members, don't hear anything. I, I, I just have a question. So what you've been considering up to now has just been the potential office tenants. What about if the first floor is a restaurant? Have you considered the parking implications of a restaurant with the restaurant staff and people coming and going and a restaurant that could be open for you know, lunch and dinner, lunch as well as dinner? Um, have you considered that in your analysis, Mr. Leach? Uh, from, an, from the analysis standpoint, it really looked at available parking that's within that quarter mile. So it could be utilized for office space. It could also be utilized for uh, restaurant staff and patrons um, in, in the, at that nighttime, in that 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. time frame. So it really included uh, all of that. And, and so if we're looking at, you know, even if we were looking at the 40 parking spaces, uh, not not associating any of the public transportation that is there, you know, over the course of that quarter mile area that those 40 parking spaces certainly 
is not a significant number when we're looking at you know the vast majority of, of spaces yes even though it might be um from a from a, a temporal standpoint someone from an office space would be parking there for most of the day if it was part of it was a, a restaurant at night uh, it would certainly be a different type of parking operation where people would actually might actually be uh in the area already have parked their vehicle already or certainly residents that there's a certain walking component to so uh, the, the quick answer is yes we, we kind of looked at it just from available parking spaces not associated with any particular land use um mr lucio um if you were to take the township's parking requirements into consideration, do you know how many spaces would be required for this building? I think uh, I think that was upwards of 80 parking spaces, if I believe uh, I remember that correctly. Yes. And that's if it's a, a non-restaurant use, correct? Right. And, and so more if it was a restaurant use, and it, it seems like there's a, you know, quite a bit of a difference, too, between um, I think you were proposing 40 spaces would be would what would be required, but yet I yeah. think it's closer to 80 by our requirements. Right. And, part, you know, part of that is, number one, over the last five years, what office space really, um, really utilized in terms of parking per square foot. Uh, and certainly now with people spread out. Uh, from from an office space standpoint, and probably stay that way for a while. Uh, from from those different categories uh, of information, the forty parking spaces for this office size is something that that is reasonable um, for me anyway. I I know it's probably hard for you to predict, but would you have a ballpark number based on what you hope? to have your hope for tenants in the building. What your estimated amount of employees that would come to these potential businesses, do, do, do you think 50 people will be coming to work or 30 people will be coming to work? That, that's a little bit more difficult to, I can't really answer that one because each space would kind of be unique for that tenant. Uh, so some might, you know, have a pretty dense uh, floor plan, where others may have a pretty open floor plan. So that's, I, I really couldn't answer that one. I'm sorry. Oh, I understand. And besides parking, uh, parking survey and study, did you do a traffic study, like a, we, we did the amount of traffic and school buses and and New Jersey Transit buses and think that was that at all in your survey uh no it really wasn't and normally you know if if we had a site uh, that had parking associated with it then we would develop trips coming to and from the site um, and how they would get there and a, a big you know portion of it especially here would be public transportation uh, to get to and from uh, the site, especially for an office building, um, for office space, I should say. And so because we really didn't need to, to really do that, nor um, would we generate the number of trips from this office space that would we require a traffic study. Um, we normally, industry standard is if we have um, over a hundred uh, transportation trips, over a hundred vehicle trips, then we would do a study uh, of at least one or two of the intersections that the traffic would, would go through. And in our case here, um, looking at different areas that people would park in, it's really uh, spread out in, in different areas and not concentrated especially on, on gates or on any near, nearby or adjacent roadways. Um, but uh, we did not do any traffic counts or analysis. Uh, and I think based on the square footage of the office space, 
it was not actually required based on industry standards. Okay, thank you. And, and the busing, you know, any any of the existing conditions that are out there are, are basically that, right? They're existing conditions and a building of this size of um, office space uh, certainly would not have uh, a negative impact because it, it just wouldn't generate enough vehicle traffic for that to be an issue. Well, we don't really know that for sure. So, do we, uh, but I do envision people coming to work, right, driving around, looking for parking spaces while school buses are coming to school, dropping off children, while teachers and staff at the Bullock School are looking for parking in the morning, going to their jobs. And um, so, so there will potentially be a building that requires 80 parking spots and that and doesn't have them and they'll be mixing up with with the with the general public and the school staff and buses so that's what i that's my visual study so thank you very much well i'll just also add briefly uh, to echo my council colleagues comments um you know certainly a couple things that i would note first with regard to the parking spaces and when the study was completed i think it does bear emphasis that during covid uh those the, those data points are absolutely low compared to what they normally are um when you noted that some people are home using parking spaces you know certainly we'll have to take exception to that in terms of looking at our parking revenue uh, we know that our meters and all the other spaces are not being utilized at rates that they would be prior um so we know they're just lower uh, you know quite simply secondly to the councilman's point um what you noted in terms of not having an impact uh when we're saying uh by normal ordinance that it would require potentially 80 spaces you're saying 40 and providing none um you know when vehicles i see it firsthand at the wellmont are constantly looking for parking, right? And people are trying to parallel park. People are stopping, people are blocking some narrow streets in that area for sure. Absolutely, it delays when you see garbage trucks now, school buses in the morning, you know, all those other pieces. Um, so it absolutely would have an impact in that regard as well. So just something I think to note, you know, again, this is mm -hmm. testimony uh, being given for the record. So for the record, you know, noting that, uh, you know, I, I certainly would agree with my council colleague and I even think Mr. Uh, Jacobson's comments earlier, but thank you. No, I, um, this is Tony. I've been listening to some of the comments, and you know we really can't do anything, right? But it would be great to hear if there's something that's constructive. Or, excuse me, something that constructive has been done where parking off peak could be provided by residential buildings that are in the area. Um, you know, you know, kind of seeking solutions rather than saying. Yeah, we know have a pro we have a problem. We can do nothing about it. And also, many of the streets I think have two hour limited parking around there. So, I mean, ultimately, the burden is going to be on the developer because he'll be, you know, trying to look up a space that is deficient in terms of being able to provide parking. But I don't know. You know, so you know, there'd be a lot of red. There's a lot of residential development around there that could provide parking during the day. And you know, maybe it just needs to. Maybe there needs to be a coordinated effort to figure out how to use that on a shared basis more efficiently. I think I, this is counsel for applicant. I think that's a very fair point. I think it's something we've discussed, with applicant, which is essentially, I think the solution is going to be somewhat market driven in that, um, you know, they're going to be required to lease this space to tenants that understand that there's no parking available on site. It's not available because it can't be. Um, you know, there is this one time exemption, but, um, you know, as a matter of law, as we've discussed, there is an ordinance, there's an exemption to the parking requirement. We're providing testimony as a courtesy to this board, not necessarily as, as testimony to back up any variance relief. Um, but I think that that's a very fair point. I think that the applicant is is going to have to work with tenants to come up with creative solutions to to um, to provide whatever needs to be provided in order to get tenancies. I think it's a very fair point. I just wanted to note that. I just wanted to add to Tony, um, you know, the parking meters have the park mobile potential, so you could stay there all day. Uh, it's there, you wouldn't be limited to two hours if you use your credit card. 
you can keep right, for the street parking. Right. Yeah. So just so you know that that occurred to me too that many of the meters are two hours, but if you use your credit card, you can keep adding to your hours. Any other questions from the board? I will open the uh, floor then to the public. If there are questions from the public of this witness concerning his testimony this evening. I can't speak. Yeah, you can. All right, the public members of the public, you're unmuted. So if you have any questions, this is your time to ask. It's questions. And see if you can talk for me, and I'll I'll explain a few things. Okay. Say your name. Yes. Can I can I speak? We hear you. All right. How do you do? Uh, let me introduce myself. I. I don't think it now you may, folks may tell me that it may be a conflict that I speak. My name is William Asmith, and I'm the owner of the building, uh, Gibraltar Van Lines, Amcal Moving and Storage, and Suburban Storage. And I uh, purchased that building back in honor, honor about 1984. And I've been watching your, uh, your meeting here this evening. And I, and I also uh, observed the uh, other meeting on July 12th when I was in California. And first, so, I. So, sir, this is for questions. Okay. Uh, to uh, the. If I'm out of line, uh, then correct me and I'll stand down. And I'd like to so, just comment on the parking, but only as per your protocols and procedures. I don't want to violate any rules. So, if, if you have a question. Uh, with reference to what the applicant's parking expert has testified, if you want to ask him questions, you can. If you would like to make a statement, you'll get that opportunity uh, a little bit later in the hearing. Okay. With all due respect to the the uh, the uh, expert engineer, very impressive. A lot of good points he made, but there's a few points that were not addressed understandably which I can bring to everyone's attention on a very positive note. So I'll wait until such time you folks tell me that that I may add my commentary. All right, fine. Very thank, good. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who has questions uh, of the witness? Doesn't, it doesn't right. like it. All right. Then, um, Mr. Murphy, uh, how many you have? Just one more witness. Just, just one more, uh, Mr. Chairman. We'd like to bring on Peter Stack, our professional planner, to justify our variance relief. All right. Oh. So, I would I would propose that we just push through, uh, unless anyone needs a break. Right now, um, I would propose that we push through and and try and get through this. We can certainly keep it as as short as possible. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I, I, that is very true, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, then let's proceed. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Mr. Peter Stack, are you, are you available? We're going to need to get you sworn in. You weren't sworn in during the last year. Uh, that's correct. And I, I, I suspect people can hear me testifying now. We can. We can. Okay. We can actually see you, Mr. Stack. This is a rare occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Would you please state your full name and business affiliation for the record? Uh, my name is Peter G. Steck, and I'm a, a licensed professional planner uh, located at 80 Maplewood Avenue, Maplewood, New Jersey. And uh, I was licensed in 19... Uh, 76 and my license is still active. And Mr. Steck, the board is very familiar with your qualifications and your history, uh, and uh, we will accept you as an expert planner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Steck, Mr. Chair, if I may, Mr. Steck, um, have you reviewed the plans being submitted to the board this evening? You've heard the testimony of both Chris Manos and, and Louis Lugio um, as it relates to this application? Yes. Wonderful. Can you please provide the board with testimony related to 
um, the planning elements of this project, um, specifically uh, addressing the variance relief being sought this evening, um, both the positive and the negative criteria under this the C standard. Yes. yes. And in conclusion, um, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll give a little short background just to lay some foundation for my testimony. Um, I'm sure the board is very familiar with this, but it is a building um, that uh, is on a relatively small lot. It's a big building. It was developed as a warehouse. Uh, it's been vacant for a number of years. Um, and that's a sign of the difficulty of uh, reusing a building like this. But it was a, a storage facility that did have some sales of uh, packing supplies, et cetera. Um, it's a non-conforming use. Uh, this zone doesn't permit warehouse uses. Um, it's in a historic district and considered a contributing property. Uh, and while it's in the uh, central business district zone, as you know, it's one step removed from Bloomfield Avenue. So it's not in the prime uh, retail corridor uh, not quite as visible, at least the front facade, uh, as other buildings in the corridor. Um, the building, uh, when it was occupied, it was there were signs on it that said Gibraltar van lines. That's that was the sign that was over the overhead door. Uh, there were two other signs on the building. Uh, one indicated customer pickup. Uh, packing materials, and the other just referencing uh, Gibraltar uh, moving in storage. Um, the application is to reoccupy the building by renovating it uh, for permitted uses, uh, office uses on the upper floors, and some type of commercial use on the ground floor, uh, be it retail or restaurant. The applicant has uh, reviewed the standards of the ordinance and adheres to those standards for a one-time uh, reuse of the property. Um, the uh, building is being expanded in its footprint by 11.72%, uh, which is under the 15% allowed, um, and it is changing the use admittedly to a more intensive use from a warehouse use, uh, which did involve obviously some truck activity uh, to a, 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 an office and either retail or restaurant use. Uh, the building is being uh, expanded. Uh, the addition that's being put on is primarily for accessibility reasons. Uh, again, we're not relying on the uh, fire escape in the rear of the building, and I'm, I'm not sure the code would allow that anymore. Um, but much of the addition uh, is to provide convenient access and safe access to the upper floors of the building. Uh, there are improvements in the rear, as discussed earlier, which is a, a patio uh, area. And there's you know considerable discussion uh, this evening about the aesthetics of the building, which is really the site plan issue that's before the board, because um, the building occupies pretty uh, pretty much the whole lot, at least the front and the sides. I note that the if you face the building on the left hand side, the uh, wall is 0.3 feet from the property line, and your code says it should be either zero or six feet, which suggests that uh, we should either extend it but offset the brick so it's like 2.6 inches uh, uh, toward the property line, or we should set it back six feet. Either would be conforming. What I want to suggest is that the current wall setback of 0.3 feet is a de minimis issue. It's essentially online. Uh, and to suggest that a uh, variance is needed for that 0.3 feet uh, doesn't make a lot of planning sense to me, especially because this does not abut another building. It doesn't create like a narrow alleyway between buildings that would be difficult <clears throat> uh, to clean. 
Um, I'm sure the board's familiar with the area. We do abut uh, the parking lot for the Greek restaurant on one side, so that's open space. Um, on the other side, we have a parking lot uh, associated for, for a residential conversion of what was a, a commercial building. Uh, part of my analysis was uh, certainly looking at your uh, master plan and it's been updated a number of times. So this is not a stale uh, master plan and uh, it was on your uh, agenda earlier this evening, um, but there is commentary in it that specifically relates to this application. And uh, just from page 69 of the master plan, I'm gonna read something. And what it basically says is that the master plan recognizes that the parking standards in your ordinance are more uh, akin to suburban standards where you have lower density uh, uses and very little, if any, mass transit. <clears throat> so under the heading of parking ratios, uh, the master plan said, Montclair parking ratios correspond to those typically used for suburban development where there is limited transit options few opportunities to bike or walk to work, and no on-street parking opportunities. Although these standards may be appropriate in parts of the township, these ratios place a financial burden on property owners and developers in Montclair Center, some of whose residents and visitors are likely to use non-auto modes of transportation and would not require a parking space. And so, uh, that paragraph continues and it repeats what the standards are uh, for this zone. And it recommends that in existing buildings, you can expand it by up to 15% without being penalized by providing more parking. And you can also change the uses to greater intensity of uses, again, without being penalized. So, um, your zoning ordinance that allows this one-time exception is completely aligned with your master plan. This was intended to be an incentive to renovate buildings. Now, this is kind of the poster child uh, because it is a building that is um, in a non-conforming use, although it's been vacant for a number of years and obviously difficult to reuse. This is a site that the only way parking would be provided is to demolish the whole building and start from scratch. And that is contrary to the um, historic nature of the district and, uh, and of this property as a contributing property. Uh, those principles about um, allowing a minor expansion and more intensive use are not only recommended in the master plan that there's that specific language that endorses that in section 347-79 of, of the <clears throat> C1 central business zone, which this property is in. So <clears throat> although parking is a great concern, um, these occupants have the right to rely on publicly accessible spaces, whether it's on street, um, whether it's uh, in a parking deck. Um, there, there are situations where over time, um, you know, people make arrangements with other businesses. It's not unusual in Montclair, for example, that if someone has extra garage space, that they rent the space. Now, that's not necessarily in accord with the zoning ordinance, but that's what happens in real life. Here's a situation where anyone looking to rent from this building is going to obviously be aware that there's no on-site parking. So while the ordinance might require 80 some odd spaces, uh, in my judgment, that would never produce that number of cars. That's a suburban standard. The master plan acknowledges that it's an inflated standard that's not realistic. Um, so in terms of the relief that we need, we don't need any parking relief. And again, that was a judgment call by the planning board in recommending uh, this procedure in the master plan. It was implemented to the letter by the governing body. If 
over time, this policy needs to be uh, revised. Uh, you started this evening talking about changes to your master plan, the land use and circulation e element. Uh, if you are uncomfortable or you have evidence that it's not working, um, obviously the governing body can change the law, but this was uh, intended uh, to be an incentive to renovate older buildings, and that's exactly what's happening here. Um, in terms of the side setback, um, a variance was cited that we're 0.3 feet from the property line, and we should have been either zero or six feet away. I would suggest, first of all, that that's not really a variance. It's a de minimis situation because 0.3 feet away from the property line is essentially on the property line in terms of dimensions of a building. But clearly there would be a hardship if we would have to, to build the addition and in a sense cantilever it 2.6 feet away from the building in order to match the property line. That makes no sense from a practical point of view and from the intent of the ordinance. It's not gonna block anyone's light, air and open space because the ordinance allows a wall right up at the property line. And again, we abut a parking lot uh, rather than uh, another building. Uh, there is an issue of signage, which is uh, we are essentially putting signs on what it, are the natural places on the building. Again, this is one step removed from Bloomfield Avenue. It's not in the retail row. Uh, so it's not gonna be in your face. And in fact, across the street, is a non-retail, non-commercial building, which is the Verizon uh, building. Uh, the signs are integrated into the architecture. Uh, again, the applicant does not know uh, who the tenants may be, but in my opinion, there are, there's clearly a hardship in the sense there's no, this was not designed as a retail building, so there's not a sign band uh, over the first floor store windows, as is the case in many buildings along Bluefield Avenue. Uh, the applicant is proposing <laughs> signage in logical spaces, uh, uh, in spaces where there historically have been signs. And in my opinion, there are clearly aesthetic benefits to proposing the signs that are being proposed. And again, this is not in an area where this signage pattern has to match adjacent buildings because the it, it, this is not in a row of buildings, as is the case in Bloomfield Avenue. So um, I would suggest that, uh, number one, that we don't need a side yard setback variance because 0.3 feet is essentially online. If we do need a variance, in my opinion, um, the variance is minor and there's clearly a hardship in having to cantilever essentially half the width of a brick uh, to match the property line. Um, so that uh, the side yard setback is either not a variance or in my opinion, there is clearly a hardship um, that, that is present. Um, the issue of signage in my opinion is one of um, promoting aesthetics. Um, and again, I repeat that this property is not in the main row with uh, the Bloomfield Avenue corridor. Uh, it's one step away, but for the convenience of the public and to attract tenants, there obviously needs to be some signage uh, for both the convenience of the public uh, in, in using the, the building. Uh, this is a one-time deal. This is an unusual building. Um, the applicant is taking advantage of public policy that's in place today and it happens to be consistent with both the master plan and the zoning ordinance. Uh, the master plan admits that the parking standard is not appropriate for this type of environment. Uh, this is an unusual section of Montclair in that there is bus traffic. Uh, the, the train station is a little over a quarter, quarter mile away, but that's generally considered to be a walkable distance. Uh, and to a certain degree, there will be a self-policing policy. Someone looking to rent this building, um, in my opinion, is not going to have, is going to recognize that parking is an issue. And there are some businesses that simply will not be attracted this, to this space uh, because it doesn't suit the nature of their employees. 
So at the end of the day, this is squarely what the master plan was looking for. There was an incentive built in to renovate buildings. This is a building that's one of the last in the area that, that needs to be renovated. Um, there's a lot of effort being put into this and there's a risk uh, by the owner in putting this money. Uh, he believes that he can attract a tenants that will utilize it, but the applicant is 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 doing a, a relatively fine job, a fine job, period, in renovating this building. And that was the intent of the master plan. I know that the board members and and are concerned about parking. Every building that's an older building in along Bloomfield Avenue, none of those buildings have code compliant parking. Uh, and it's simply the nature of a urbanized downtown that public parking is the solution. If, if every building had code compliant parking, you would have a suburban development along a state highway where no one went from one building to the other. They would be separated by parking lots. That's not the nature of this area. So um, in my opinion, this is essentially a variance free application, although there might be a hardship with the side setback. I believe the signage uh, promotes aesthetics as well as the public convenience in identifying the building. And I believe um, that any variances that are sought can be granted uh, without substantial detriment to the public good and without substantial impairment of the zone plan and zoning ordinance. I believe you, you said this early in your testimony, but I missed it. When was the building last sort of in its heyday in full use? Um, well, the owner can testify that, but I know talking to Mr. Genova that it's been vacant for a number of years because Mr. Genova has looked at it over time. It's, it's and I, I, I'm not gonna venture a guess and potentially the, the owner can indicate how long it's been vacant, but it's clearly been a vacant or near vacant for many years. Again, uh, I can't remember, uh, well, when I was working in town, which is over 20 years ago, um, it was certainly occupied, but again, it's not, it was not an active use, but it's a storage use. Again, not a use that's appropriate for a downtown where you want activity and you want people to um, interrelate between nearby businesses. And so, because it was a storage use, is it fair to say that even when it was fully used, there were not a lot of full-time employees there that were that were taking up parking in the general area? I'm sure that that's the case. I, I'm guessing the, the difference was there was probably truck traffic um, that um, might have been disruptive to the area because there's no place to load on the property. You would have to load from the street. So it's a trade-off. But in terms of... And you're in, and in terms your of parking in demand, town, oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And in your experience in town, have there been other buildings in that, as you put it, urbanized downtown corridor where we took a building that was not in extensive use and replaced it with a building that under the ordinary parking ordinances would require upwards of 80 spots? Um, I don't know of another building uh, you know, obviously in the, in the redevelopment area. And, and again, uh, the buildings that have conforming parking are buildings that are completely new. They tore down what was present. Uh, that's not what the public policy is here. The public policy is I, to preserve this building. We, we are, so we are in agreement about many things. I, I you know, you, you, you put it aptly that, that your client is taking advantage of existing public policy. And it is what it is, but you know this is this is more testimony telling us that we ought to suck it up. Okay, I get it. The law is the law, and you've got the ability to plant this thing there that needs 80 parking spaces. That there's nothing we can do about it. I'm not planning on voting for any variances. So if the chairman determines that there are variances required, I'm not voting for them because I think that this is not an appropriate. I think this is going to hit our downtown so hard. The, uh, Mr. It, you know. Mr. Chair, if I if I may, Mr. Stack. So, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Council, on the record, there there are variants. There is variance relief being sought for for signage um, and for pre-existing non-conforming formity as it relates to a side yard setback. 
um, we believe we put on testimony that in the event that there is a variance, which we believe there might not even be one for the side yard setback, even if there is one, we believe that we meet the criteria of the municipal land use law. Um, we have a board member stating that he's going to deny the application um, on the record based on I'm not sure what, but um, because we do have a one time exemption that's clear as a matter of law. Um, I just need to put that on the record that we have a member of the board who's saying that he will deny the application for I'm still. Mr. Oh, yeah, Mr. Murphy, good, can good I just good for you for is my vote may not be called for tonight because I'm an alternate member, but I'm telling I, I you know, you, you you made the decision, sir, to come to the planning board tonight with these two witnesses whose whose apparent position it is that we ought to be happy with the fact that the law is what the law is. I, you know, I, I wasn't the one arguing for this. You came with testimony that I consider to be an insult to this board because you are saying that not only do we have to accept it, but that we should be happy with it. I am not. Mr. I Jacobson, I, un Mr. Jacob, I, 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 again, excuse me, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, we're just trying to put on tip. You intended to cut me off and you did, but go ahead. Um, understood. Um, I, I apologize for that, for, for cutting you off. I do. Um, I appreciate your concern. I, we're trying to put on testimony as it relates to the application. We're trying to give everyone, Mr. Chairman and the rest of the board, um, as much information as possible. I apologize if some of the testimony offended you. We're, we're trying to, to make as thorough of a presentation as possible. No, I appreciate that. And look, I, but you've heard it from the mayor, you've heard it from Councillor Slager, you've heard it from multiple members of the board, that the park, this is going to have a negative impact on parking. It is going to have a significantly negative impact on parking. I agree completely with the testimony of your experts that, you know, it, it, you are taking advantage of existing law. The existing law is what it is. We have very little leverage, but some of the leverage we do have is to say no to variances if we don't like the overall impact of the building. I, I'm 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 doing you the favor of stating my reasons on the record. It's right. so my vote's not so, necessary, so, so there you and go. Maybe, maybe counsel for the board can advise you on your duties as it relates to municipal land use law and whether you vote in favor of or against a variance um, and how that is separate from voting in favor or against a, a preliminary mile site plan approval so i think i think the record is now clear on the positions of the various members and of the applicant i would re respectfully request that you move on mr murphy um and, and let's get to this bottom of this application i agree we we are i believe that concludes our testimony mr snack if that's the only thing i want to uh, say that the um, alleged detriment of 80 spaces, even your master plan says that that's not correct, that's not accurate, and we have expert testimony estimating whatever, 40 some odd spaces. So I just, I want to make it clear that if you're uncomfortable, it, from a functional point of view, I think you should be uncomfortable with the new demand for 40 spaces, but I don't think there's any evidence that there would actually be um, 80 cars uh, generated at one time from this property. Actually, Mr. Steck, that's not what the expert testified to. He testified to approximately 40 cars from the tenants alone with an unknown number of cars being required by visitors. And then as Councillor Schlager pointed out, if there's a restaurant on the first floor, the number goes up from there. I remember exactly what the expert testified to. So you're, you're not helping the situation any. It, it is, as I said, it is what it is, but I've gone on long enough, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Are there any questions from the board of Mr. Stack? Any questions from the public of Mr. Stack? Yes, my name is Frank Rabacki. Yes, Mr. Rabacki. Uh, Mr. Stack, are you aware that um, this property is in a transit village that, um, that under a transit village designation, which is a half mile, not a quarter mile? Uh, 
there, there are two standards uh, by New Jersey Transit, and they, you're right that they do go up to a half mile. Uh, and New Jersey Transit recognizes that when you're closer than a half mile, and especially if you're closer than a quarter mile, automobile usage goes down. Okay, and and their their checklist for points for qualifying points um, do encompass automobiles uh, or offices uh, within that half mile of the transit station um, as a positive benefit. I just want to make sure that's clear. That, that's my understanding of when you're up. Again, there are in a sense a point system when you're when you want to be designated a transit village and and a key issue is walking distance to the train okay and then when the one of the board members um asked you about if you knew of any properties um that had been in disuse and now were requiring uh, a more intensive use or, or a significant uh their use would be a significant significant uh, new use would be significant parking impact. I was wondering, um, would, are, are you, I don't know how familiar you are with Montclair, but are you familiar with either 544 Bellevue Avenue, um, the recent planning board review of that? Uh, uh, I, I am familiar with Montclair, but I'm not, is that, is that the theater building? Yes. Uh, I'm familiar that there's an effort to renovate that building and there's maybe uh, six parking spaces in the rear of it so that's again no, no, i'm talking about i'm talking about the french restaurant that oh got a new building uh, i'm not has, i'm not i'm not familiar with that application are you familiar with the bellevue theater in upper montclair yes that's been in disuse and and the the counselor and the mayor have sent a request to the planning board for to develop that property under rehabilitation law? Uh, I'm not aware of those movements, but I'm aware that the, the, the building has been closed and there are only, I think, six or seven parking spaces associated with that building. Okay. Thank you. That's my question for Mr. Steck. Any other yeah. questions from the public? Anything better? Nope, no more questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, that concludes your case. Um, Mr. Murphy, I would now open up the floor to the public for any general comments about the application as a whole. Uh, I know we have at least one a gentleman who wishes to be heard. Um, so if uh, you'll open up the mics to the public once again, Janice, or keep them open if you didn't close them. Um, and uh, now is the time for the public to be heard on comment. Um, I guess I'm the only one, Frank Rebecca. Am well, I on? You're, we hear you, Mr. Rebecca. I don't think you're the only one, but go ahead. Oh, you got uh, first come, first serve. Okay, very well. Thank you. Um, I support this application first. Uh, um, it complies with our existing laws. Um, I've warned the council and the planning board for years about the 15% incentive, and now it's coming back to bite us. And so we need to suck it up, as one member aptly pointed out. Uh, I don't think we have a legal case to reject the variances based on what you did with Lorraine Avenue and other properties, that office building there with a the setback. The signage, I mean, that you you can't even go there. That's that that would just be a travesty if the planning board hung this application up on the sign ban. Um, so I'm not quite sure what ground you would hold this up on. Um, the thing that um, irritates me is is the comments towards this applicant who has a you know, it's a strong application um, and it is highly inconsistent with the position of both the council and the planning board just within the last year or two. Um, you know, I mentioned 544 Bloomfield Avenue, where you added 80 parking spots on a one-time exemption. Um, that was just crazy. That, and then you added a building and said, no, it's not really, it was an existing kind of use. Um, 
the, the Councilor Ma uh, Mayor Spiller and Councilor Slager sent a request for a re re rehabilitation review of the Bellevue Theater. That's going to be 400 parking spaces. So, and we're encouraging that. We're actually encouraging that kind of situation. And then to tell this applicant over 40 spaces, and then Councilor, you know, Schlager and Mayor Spiller, and you guys did Lackawanna, which was what, 400 spaces? And that the council sent a pilot date. Okay, we're gonna pilot two places in the entire downtown, a pot retailer, and it's right down the street. It's within 200 feet of this site. And yes, we're gonna use the retail standard for parking, which is what? Five cars per thousand, or I don't even know what it is. But I mean, the inconsistency of this is, is just galling. And quite frankly, he, there are so many grounds for a lawsuit on this that I, I, I would list them gladly for the applicant if they need help. But anyway, I think you should support it. And I think I've made my point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Backey. Anyone else? Now's your time to speak. You're unmuted. Mr. Anders, you're muted. If you want to speak, you have to unmute yourself. Azimuth, I'm sorry, Azimuth. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't hear anything from Mr. Azimuth. All right, going once, going twice. I guess we have no further comment then. Um, Mr. Murphy, do you wish to be heard? Sum up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the board. Uh, we appreciate your time this evening. You know, I hope this was a productive hearing for everyone. Um, you know, we we put on on experts that we believed would would help. Um, you know, paint a clear picture of, of what we're trying to do here. And and um, we we hope that that was helpful to to, to most of you and, and everyone here um, tonight. Uh, again, we we respectfully request that the board grant preliminary and final site plan approval along with uh, the variance relief requested this evening um, and the conditions that were agreed to um, as part of this hearing. Um, we thank you for your time and, and um, consideration of this application. All right, thank you, Mr. Murphy. All right, so the um, hearing is now closed. Uh, members of the board, what's your pleasure? John, are you calling for um, uh, just general discussion or? I'm calling for the board to express themselves as they feel it's appropriate. If you want to make a motion, if you want to state your opinion, if you want to ask a question, this is the time that is for us to discuss this and to make make a decision one way or the other. So, Tony, um, what do you have to say about this? Um, well, I like it because it really breathes some life into an old building, so I think it's good. I'm not really afraid that it's going to be a big problem. I think that the developer is going to be highly incentivized to find parking for his tenants. He has to do that in order to make it successful. We also have a lot of multifamily properties that have vacant spaces during the day. There's lots of potential for shared parking. And also, when you think about if even if Lackawanna is being redeveloped into residential, people could have an office here and just walk from their apartments to their office. They might not need a car. Not to mention bicycling in. So I think it's fine. I'm not really afraid of it. Um, can I make a motion to approve the application? And then if someone seconds it, we can have a discussion just to move the process forward. That's the way it works, Carmel. <laughs> okay, so I'm making a motion to approve the application. Um, help me out here, subject. To second. I would second it. <laughs> All right, so we have, um, but I get the impression that we we are interested in getting some conditions on the record. 
Um, and um, from the uh, discussions, uh, the applicant, aside from our standard um, conditions, uh, have you made notations art along the uh, along the route of uh, what the applicant has indicated they'd agree to? I have. Um, and if you wish, I can just run through them. Yes, please. Um, I, some of them may be a little convoluted because I'm not sure I understood the board's intent, but I'm sure you're going to help me clarify them. The first one related to um, the second story brick will be given a different treatment insofar as color goes. I'm not sure I understood what you, and I think that was you, John. I think you were. I think we're talking about the the two-story portion of the building, the right. front facade, uh, that the applicant would make every effort to, to give some color differentiation between the brick on that and the finish on the, what's currently the beige side or the, um, um, site that's to be cleaned uh, that they're going to strip and 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 uh, reveal what's underneath in order to uh, break up the mass of the front of the facade. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next note I have relates to the grout. The grout will be black and will not and the applicant will not pull out the brick either above or below the block windows. So the grout for the glass block windows is going to be painted black. Uh -huh. And the um, coloring for the panels uh, uh, on the um, that are above and below the solid uh, stucco or concrete panels that are above or below the glass block window, uh, they are going to be um, shaded uh, gray was that Carmel we agreed it, it was that they would be shaded gray along with the um, uh, top of the um, parapet wall above that so that it would be uh, some uniformity in color and uh, would dovetail with the gray on the top of the building okay um in the event that uh, this relates to the engineer's letter, in the event that uh, the, the PERC test comes back uh, and the applicant is required to tie into the municipal system, the applicant will show uh, drawings to that effect and, uh, and update the drainage. Yes. Um, the applicant will consider using native plantings. Um, the, and, and this, the, the next several uh, points that I have relate to the applicant's relationship to the bid. And uh, the first is that the, uh, uh, the applicant will use the budget and uh, the bids process, uh, sorry, the budget and processing of the of the uh, the works will be subject to the satisfaction of the bid, and that will be conducted at both the cost of everything and uh, the process itself will be at the applicant's expense and under the applicant's control. But but also subject to our final review of the uh, artist product. Yes, right. that's my that's my next point. I didn't get there yet, Cardinal. You're you're a step ahead of me. Uh, but even before I get to that one, uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to phrase this, but I'm sure Mr. Murphy and I can work together to come up with appropriate phraseology for the fact that the applicant will continue maintenance of the mural, um, and uh, we'll, Mr. Murphy and I will figure out something to I, I believe will be satisfactory to the board. Right, the mural wall or whatever art installation is going to go on that wall will be subject to ma maintenance um, and that um, it will pass to the next owner. It'll be part of the um, part of this uh, grant or approval. Rather. Do, we, do we need to um, record the resolution? 
uh, with the deed? It, it may be necessary to do that, Mr. Brodock, but Mr. Murphy and I will deal with that. Uh, and uh, if, if he and I agree and I check the law and confirm that it has to be that way, uh, then that will be included in the resolution condition that you will see before you approve. Right. Thank you. Well, um, the revisions committee will be kept in the loop of uh, of the process of the murals uh, development uh, in order to ensure the board's intent is brought into that process. Right. Well, that's part of the whole uh, the whole final review process. Yes. Right. But I want to, it will be separate and I want to make it clear that uh, and will that be the board's revisions committee or a, another subcommittee? The revisions committee. OK, uh, those are the those are the conditions that I was able to discern from the uh, from the application. So, so Arthur, I just want to confirm the, the revisions committee role is the intent of the mural and not the content. Right. Because we're we want to allow the artists right the the, the um, applicant to get as much artist input as possible and to come up with the best design as possible we just want to make sure that the final design is in two feet by three feet right exactly <laughs> I, I, <laughs> not only that i think it could be, could be could be excellent but two it has to be I you know <laughs> And go ahead, Carmel. Wouldn't we, want to also, wouldn't we want to also make sure that the artwork is not potentially objectionable to the community? Oh, I sure. Think that's, I mean, that's part of the whole. That's part yeah. of the whole. I think that's why the bid has a jury. It's and gonna, it's, right. And it's that's part of the board's intent that, you know, we're not, we, we don't want, we want something that's going, the intent is to enhance the downtown, um, you know, and uh, so that naturally goes against you know, having something that's going to offend everybody or even a portion. Was I mistaken? I thought earlier on we had said something about um, or not this meeting, but the prior meeting about the sidewalk and any sidewalk trees. Was that did that come up or my dream in that? I don't know if the sidewalk needs any repair. That was in my report that the sidewalk needs to be um repaved with like to create like a plaza and they do need street trees okay oh i thought i wasn't dreaming it then thanks jen <laughs> okay so we will yeah, report we those conditions art uh, i'm sorry i didn't hear that can we incorporate those conditions art uh, about the sidewalk to address the sidewalk and the um, uh, street plantings sure yeah. and i also think the depressed curb Right to be removed. It's that was part of Ms. Talley's memo as well. Right. Yes. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Brodock, because generally when I put together a resolution, uh, a couple of things happen. One, I review all of the reports, including Ms. Talley's as well as the uh, engineer's report. And then as most of you, if not all of you know, I generally send it to the applicant's attorney and uh, he and I hash out any issues or problems. Um, in, in this regard, Mr. Murphy, um, have you heard anything tonight that uh, uh, that you find uh, either objectionable or or not uh, precisely what the board has uh, um, agreed to, or you as the applicant's attorney have agreed to? I, I do not, and I, I believe everything that we've um, discussed here, as as it relates to the conditions, are items that are on the record and have been discussed. And <laughs> And I just like to add that um, uh, whether the stars or the planets are aligned in some specific fashion, I'm not sure, but you should note everybody for your records that this is one of the uh, occasions where I happen to have agreed with everything that Mr. Steck said in his testimony. <laughs> I thought, um, and uh, uh, that is a rarity. <laughs> um, no offense, Mr. Steck. Mr. Steck was the town planner when I was a baby attorney. So I'm uh, um, just starting to practice. So uh, but um, I, I, I thought that he laid everything out correctly um, and uh, that his assessments were on point. Um, you know, I just like to make that point on the record. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So I also, before, before I came to the meeting, I just wanted to tell everybody that hell froze over earlier. And, it was, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Councillor, if I may, I, I believe that, that Mr. Stack would also like that in the record and um, in the resolution and also record it. That, that comment must be recorded for the history. <laughs> uh, the, the, the chairs or mine? <laughs> uh, I think both, maybe. <laughs> All right, so I guess that's the motion. It's been seconded by uh, uh, Carol. Um, right, Carol? Yep. yep. Yes. And I'll, I'll call the roll. Okay. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Braddock. Yes. Mr. Cook. Yes. Mr. Ian Lally. Yes. Uh, Ms. Lockheed. Yes. Yes. Councillor Schlager. No. Uh, Mayor Spiller. No. Miss Willis. Yes. Mr. Uh, Chair Wynn. Yes. And Mr. Jacobson. Am I eligible? Yeah, we have two people who are out, so you're eligible. No. Okay. We have one, two, three, four, five, six yeses and three noes. All right, gentlemen. Um, congratulations. We wish Thank you the best. Thank you so project. much. Sure. Thank you, members. We look forward to seeing the completed project. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, Janice, do we have um, any uh, committee reports? Uh, John? Yes. Um, I remember that at the meeting at which we discussed uh, the cannabis issue, that we were saying that we wouldn't have a chance to make any other comment uh, because there would be no meeting. But we are lucky in the sense that we had this meeting tonight. And I also remember that Janice on the 30th of July has sent us a memo regarding what the state law was with regard to this. And it might be just a good idea for us to send that on to the uh, council because we have the opportunity to do so because we hadn't said it in the meeting. We, she, at that time, she said she could not include it in our notes. But tonight, we as a board could say, could she just please send us send on that memo that gave us the quote from the state law as regards to the fact that what we do in one part of the uh, neighborhood zone, eligible people in the other part are eligible to compete under the same regulation. And we cannot do otherwise. I, I believe it's, that was um well we didn't go into detail about that in our, our memo i think the township attorney did okay yeah, but I, if, you're if saying that, matter, that the council i was going to say if it's a matter of state law then the council has to take that into consideration that's what i was trying to say that 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 the state law really basically supported our comments and that it was just convenient for us as the planning board to send that those comments forward so to remind them of that now you're saying they already know we don't have to do that i just thought it was a good idea for us to as a board send that forward as just just as a reference that was on the record so okay so just so that you know the the public hearing the second reading on that ordinance is tomorrow night that's what i know that's what i was saying we read tonight if there is no conflict, we do want to make sure that the council is aware of it and that if that was just a suggestion. Okay. We're saying it won't fall through the cracks either way, so I'm not really pushing the issue. Okay. Um, committee reports? Anything? I don't think we have anything to report. The DRC met last week. Um, but nothing out of the out of, or out of the ordinary. Okay. Well, you might want to talk about that. The DRC met till. I don't. Meeting. Yeah, but it's it's pending application. So. So, so we shouldn't be discussing a pending application uh, outside of the hearing. Yeah. We just state what it is because it actually does have some relevance to this hearing. Well, I think at the hearing. Um, it can be it can be discussed at the hearing. 
but we shouldn't be discussing it now. Right. right. Okay. What I have left is uh, payment of bills. So I would move to approve the bills. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. All right, everyone. I'm uh, sorry we didn't take a break, but hey, it's only it's 1013 and we're done. So, <laughs> so you're at a great meeting, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank all of you for your participation. Uh, good to see your smiling faces. And uh, I look forward to seeing them at our next meeting, which is in two weeks. In two weeks. Very good. <laughs> same bat time, same bat channel. Yep. <laughs> all right, everyone. Have a good evening. Same to you. Good evening, all. Take good care. night, everybody.